And I started with this thing called Imagination Station, which was imagining, I was imagining the kids in these DHS rooms. And I was like, how can I teach them to just look around at the objects, like whether it's a chair or a, you know, a desk or Janet at the front desk who looks scary and like looking at them and noticing and then writing down characteristics and then changing that chair into you know, Robert, the robot or the plant into like Perdita, the plant, and then writing a story. And I just wanted them to get lost in their imagination. And so that was the impetus to this. Welcome to Business with Purpose. I'm your host, Molly Stillman of Still Being Molly. And this show is all about bringing you the stories behind the brands, the companies, and the small businesses that are out there changing the world. Each week, I interview an entrepreneur, a CEO, a nonprofit director, a community leader, or just an incredible person who is trying to make a positive impact, not only through their personal life, but also with their career. My goal each week is to show you, the listener, that no matter what you do for a living, you can make an impact wherever you are. My guest this week is Joy Egrich Reed. Joy is the founder of Punchline Agency, a literary and speaking agency that represents and develops communicators. And she has also been a communicator and speaker herself over the last decade. She's the author of Get to the Publishing Punchline, a fun and slightly aggressive 30-day guide to get your book ready for the world to demystify the publishing process for a wider audience. She is also the author of Writing with Bernard the Baguette, a kid's fun and silly guide to discover the joys of writing. Joy and her husband, Matt, have been living in Paris, France since 2017 and have two children, Millie and Emerson. Joy has given them alter egos named Rick and Rita and posts about them constantly on Instagram. Only time will tell how much therapy this will result in them needing. Joy is such a, and I kid you not, this is not a play on words, but true. She's such a joy. She and I have so much in common. We have uh, become fast friends. Uh, She is now my literary and speaking agent, which is so exciting. She's just absolutely incredible. I have wanted to have her on the podcast for years and I'm finally getting to it here. Here we are in the year 2022. Happy new year, by the way. Oh my gracious. It's 2022. I'm just so excited to have her on the show. We talk about everything from our weird entrepreneurial backgrounds to our love of improvisational comedy and how that can help you in your business and in your, you know, whether you're in sales or you're a speaker or you're a communicator, or guess what? If you're in relationships with somebody else, Improv can help you. So we talk all about that. We also talk about how she has used her book, Get to the Publishing Punchline, to impact authors and writing with Bernard the Baguette to get kids in the foster care system excited about writing and kids all across the globe, really. You are going to fall in love with Joy. This was such a fun conversation. So sit back, relax, or go on a walk or do whatever it is you do while you listen to podcasts and enjoy my conversation with Joy Egrich reed I don't think I've been this excited to record an episode in a long time because I have the inimitable Joy Egrich Reed on the show with me today. Hi, Joy. How are you? Hi. I am equally excited. So this is going to just be lots of squeals and giggles. It really is. It's going to be. I just am. (laughs) This is the perfect way to start off the new year um, with some laughing and some joy. Uh, You're like, this is my favorite podcast of the whole year. The whole year. This is the best one and we've done all year and it hasn't even started yet. Um, okay, so I'm we're going to dive right in because I just there's so much I want to talk with you about. Um, so give us the joy 101, who you are, what you do, how you got to where you are today. It was a cold summer morning in June. <laughs> and uh, no, I was uh, I was born in Michigan and um, I grew up. Uh, as a pastor's daughter. And so I watched my father speak from stage and always loved, I didn't realize that I loved public communication, but I loved being on stage. I loved just watching people talk. And, um, but I always felt growing up dumb. You know, I felt like in school, like everybody else was getting stuff, but I wasn't. And um, it wasn't until college that I decided to take communication courses that I was like, oh, Oh, this is my thing. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah. like this. I get this. It's not that I was dumb. I just hadn't really found my lane yet. And um, so after college, well, I mean, how how much detail do you want here? No, keep going. Well, it's so funny because I was listening to your uh, Sharon Says So episode and she was talking about how she went from being like a knitter to like <laughs> dot, hand dyeing yarn I and know. then I know. developed her. Yeah. So 
that my, I think everybody's life that has an entrepreneurial spirit, even if they don't, is probably somewhat like that. You've yeah. got all your crazy jobs. Um, but in school, in communication studies, I thought I was going to go into reconciliation and conflict resolution. I was really impacted by studying apartheid. I did a semester all over Southern Africa, um, studying the Truth and Reconciliation Conference. So that was like what I wanted to do. And then one night I babysat. Uh, for this family. I went to school in Santa Barbara. So it was like this wealthy family. I never babysat for them before. And the wife was still getting ready. And I think the husband like was training to become like a motivational speaker. He's like, what do you want to do with your life, Joy? And I was like, well, I'm going to go into conflict resolution and reconciliation. He's like, (laughs) I don't believe, like he was just really, he's like, what do you, what makes you really excited? Like what gets you so, and I'm like, um, fashion. (laughs) (laughs) So literally, I mean, this is the power of words. Like this guy like got me so amped up and I didn't, here's where I feel like sometimes we need to take a beat. You know, I'm, I'm action oriented. And I just was like, okay, I forget, you know, healing people's conflict in countries around the world. I'm going to go to fashion school. (laughs) And so I like applied that night after college, I moved down to Los Angeles. I I was accepted to fit them. Uh, which is the fashion fashion institute down there. And that was like my track. I thought I was going to do that. Thankfully, uh, because of a myriad of different things, I ended up postponing my enrollment and uh, had a couple of internships first before like going into school again. And was like, oh goodness, I don't think that this industry is for me. Yeah. Um, so then simultaneously, my dad, who was the communicator that I saw growing up, he wrote his first book um, and it was a marriage book. And they had been, my parents had been traveling around speaking on marriage for several years. And so then when this book came out, kind of their events of like 50 people or so exploded to like thousands of people. And so they were like, "Uh, we need help. And I was like, oh, I like to tell you what to do. I'll I'll be the director of your conferences. So I got into this whole field of like directing their speaking engagements and then um, was just around my dad with publishers and that whole industry. And so then that's a journey of about a decade of speaking and writing myself, um, which has led me now to having a speaking and literary agency called Punchline Agency. So was that? Yes. No, that's perfect. (laughs) It's it's absolutely perfect. I love, I I like the background because it's like, people are like, wait, she went from conflict resolution to fashion to public speaking. Yes. (laughs) I love it because I, so many people, so many entrepreneurs have similar stories to that where they're like, I realized that my career path makes zero sense. And I'm like, no, and absolutely, because there's, I think, especially people that are kind of wired with an entrepreneurial mindset have this kind of like, they see something, they're like, well, I want to do that. And like, I want to do that. I want to do that. And so I mean, I interviewed a guy a couple months ago, like who literally runs seven million dollar businesses. And like, one of them is like a contracting, like he's like a construction company. One of them's an event company. I mean, they're all like, none of them are related. But it's like people that are like that are their brains are just wired that way. Um, And so I'm always fascinated by people's tracks to eventually like get where they are, because sometimes you look back and you go, well, if I had just changed like one little decision, you wouldn't necessarily be where you are now or you would have gone a different path. And it's so encouraging to hear other people's stories, especially I, I like to share it for people who are maybe coming out of college or whatever, and just thinking like, I've got to have this all figured out now. And I think, you know, it was really interesting. One of the jobs that I had before directing my parents um, speaking engagements was at this, this fashion company and the president of the company, she was she was kind of a motivational speaker in of herself. I was just in awe of her. And I remember her, they offered me a promotion and I was kind of like, I was like, well, I'm, I have to be honest with you. Like my, my parents are traveling and speaking and I think I'm probably going to go work for them. She was like, I appreciate you being really honest with me, but she's like, um, I want to tell you as someone who's been in business a little bit longer than you, like just go after all the opportunities that are presented to you. And you don't know when you're going to start working for your parents. And so if you're still here and I'm offering you a promotion and you have an opportunity to learn another facet of our company, like you should say yes to that. And that was really foundational for me. I think it kind of ties in. We, we want to talk about kind of our background in improv, yeah. just like saying yes to things. And I think it also coincides with an entrepreneurial spirit. And sometimes those things aren't going to work out, mm-hmm. but like, 
I think entrepreneur, like if you have that spirit, I think sometimes people think like, oh, well, this thing didn't work out. So I failed. And it's like, no, it's a stepping stone. It's part of the journey. And don't let people who are real in a box make you feel like, oh, you just like change your mind a bunch. Mm -hmm. No, it builds upon each other. Yeah. hundred percent. hundred percent. Okay. There's a couple of different facets that I want to touch on. Um, but, uh, real quick, we obviously have to address the fact that you also live in Paris, uh, yes. with your, with your family. <laughs> um, and so what led you guys to Paris and, and how has it worked working like for yourself, but your clients are all for the most part American <laughs> and, yeah. and living in Paris. What has that been like? Like what led you there and, and how that's been working out? Yeah. Well, it was um, my husband's job that brought us over here. Um, He works for the French electric company. And when we were dating, um, I found out that he worked for a company that the French electric company owned in the U S. So he worked with when I said he, he worked with windmills. That's how I described his job. It was much more (laughs) intricate than that. But, um, and we were dating and I found out that uh, he, it was owned by a French company that was based in Paris. And I was like, if you move us to Paris, I will marry you. <laughs> so that was part of the impetus because he yeah. wanted to marry me. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it was, thankfully, he didn't get the job offer until after we were married. So he doesn't have that uh, fear that I only married him for it. But when the opportunity arose, we were like, let's do it. This will be fun. Um, and we thought maybe it was just going to be a year. And simultaneously, I was in between. So I had kind of wrapped up the work that I had done for my parents. I felt like there was a nice bow on it and I was kind of done. Love my parents, but I was just like, I think I'm ready for something new. And I was in the process of figuring that out. Simultaneously, I still was like my dad's speaking and literary agent just for him. Mm -hmm. And um, people found out about that because I had been in the world of speaking and writing. People were like, would you represent me? And I'm like, no, I'd have to start a whole agency. No, I don't think I want to do that. And then Matt, as he was interviewing for these, this position, they were like, okay, what does your wife do? Because they had brought people over before. And if the spouse didn't have a job, it could sometimes go south because they'd be like, who am I? What am I doing? Yeah. And um, so they were like very concerned about giving him the opportunity if I didn't have something. Um, and so that kind of like, I think it was just kind of my Midwest mentality. I was like, well, I guess it's time to start a speaking literary agency. (laughs) Um, So I launched it a week before we moved abroad to a country where I don't speak the language. And I would not recommend doing that. (laughs) That was really hard because it was just kind of like, uh, it was just too much all at once. I think I wish I would have, you know, maybe spent the first year just like learning the language because I still, as I said to you before we started recording, like, I am terrible at French and I haven't had the bandwidth because I was launching a company that's in English. I'm working all day in English. And then I've had two babies. So you only have so much brain space. And at a certain point, I was like, I, I'm going to learn enough French to be polite about how much French I don't know yeah. <laughs> to French people. But so that's how it started. And it's been up and down and it's hard at times. But um, the Marco Polo app, which I asked you to get on when we yeah. started working together, I was like... like that's been a game changer because it's like, I can leave messages for my, my partner. There's uh, Holly. She runs the speaking side of punchline. Um, we communicate on that all day long. Um, but it's at our, you know, half the time I'm responding to her, she's asleep and vice versa. So Marco Polo has been a game changer. If that app ever goes under then punchline probably will too. <laughs> <laughs> Something else will come in its place. Something else will come yeah, in its place. Yeah. Um, well, I think it's absolutely fascinating and I've obviously enjoyed over the years, like I remember when you guys first moved, like I followed you on Instagram then. And I remember when you guys first moved there and you were in your first apartment, you didn't even have a uh, Millie yet. And you were yeah. taking, you were learning French. Like, I want to feel like th- the program you were using looked like a, like a DOS, like, you know, like yes. old school, you know what I'm talking <laughs> yes. about, right? Yes. It was like yes. some French language program and you would like show the different things <laughs> that you were learning. And I was like, what program is this? Oh, it was some friends of my parents, which I've actually thought, I'm like, I need to log into that again. It, what, what breaks my heart is that the like principles, because it was this guy that taught um, French and Spanish in the school system, and he did it all like audibly. Like he's like, you shouldn't see the words in French and Spanish before you hear them a bunch. And I'm much more of an audible learner. Um, and French words are just so much weirder. Like if you try to pronounce them through your English speaking lens, it just kind of screws up the pronunciation forever. And so he started taking what he had been teaching the school system and made it into this like online program. But he started it in, I swear he started building it like 
when the internet was created. Like 1978 <laughs> or something. And, and so he just kind of kept building upon that program. And I was way back at those first lessons and it yeah. was, I could barely figure out how to use it. Yeah. I was like, am I on, on an old school Atari right yes, now? That's, <laughs> yes, that's exa- I remember that. Like that's so, which is like maybe weird that I remember that very vividly, like when you were first yeah. uh, living in France. So, okay. So with all of that context in mind, um, we're going to go back a little bit and there's uh, something about you that obviously you and I have in common, and that is our love of improvisational comedy. And yes. um, I want to talk on that, not just because it's fun and we can talk improv all day long and, and why we love it so much, but also because I know you have this uh, same feeling. And this is something that I tell people all the time. I say, if you want to be a good communicator, if mm-hmm. you want to be a good salesperson, if you want to be a good leader, business Mm -hmm. owner. I mean, literally pretty much name anything, take an improv class. And I'm like, even if you don't want to be a comedian, take an improv class because the foundational principles of improvisation can be used across so many platforms. And I mean, I've done so, I mean, countless, you know, workshops and uh, trainings for, you know, businesses with, you know, doing kind of like improv workshops with them. The funniest being I did an improv workshop, uh, like improv for financial advisors. My (laughs) husband's a financial advisor. And it was like me me, and like, I don't know, 12 uh, older hedge fund, fund, you know, like (laughs) uh, very uppity, like buttoned up suit uh wearing guys yeah. getting them to like play yes and games nasdaq and, numbers are like yes, running behind I mean, your head just, and you're like okay and i'm like all right we're gonna play uh you know we're gonna play a qu- the question game you know or something like that just it, it was a, quite a thing but by the end uh, some of the things that they would say to me after that like i never thought about communicating in my business the way that you know, you talked about. So it's something that I want to touch on because I think so many entrepreneurs, I mean, anybody that's listening can, can benefit from these things. So number one, how did you get into improv? Like, where did that come from? And, uh, and what did that look like for you? Well, it's exactly what you just described. And, and let's preface this, like (laughs) you are, you have a background, like a crazy background. And I feel very honored because I think you said that you barely talked about your improv background on your podcast, right? Am I like the first person? Oh, I feel very honored because I feel like I can talk about it forever. I only took improv classes for about five years in Portland before we moved here. So I miss it dearly. We've been here for five years, but you, I mean, can you just tell the people real quick, like, (laughs) <laughs> all that you did. How many years was it? And you would you would go to Chicago, years. you would go to New York, you go to LA. Yeah, years and years. Um, so I took my first improv class ever in high school. And so because when I say I did sketch an improv comedy for 15 years, I started um in high school doing uh just sketch stuff. I mean, I would I was obviously a theater and choir kid, but I would write these little sketches and I would read about the history of SNL and I would just because there wasn't when I was a teenager, it's not like I was, I knew what, you know, comedy schools to go to other than like Second City or the Groundlings. And yeah. so I just consumed as much information as I could via books and watching. I mean, I would watch Saturday Night Live and I would do impressions like constantly of different characters or mad TV. And so I would put these sketches on, I would like film them um, in my room. And so that's like where I started. And so I say yeah. like, that, that's truly how I started. Cause I mean, I was 12, I was 13 um, yeah. when I was doing that. And then as I got older and I, I, the t- I always laugh that the, the school I chose where I went to college, one of the biggest reasons I chose it was because they had a really um, well uh, respected and renowned sketch comedy group. And hmm. so I, um, I went to, to Christopher Newport University and they had this sketch comedy group on campus called Seeing You Tonight. And that was pretty much why I chose that school. And so like the wow. first week of school, I went to the interest meeting and just like fell in love with sketch. And so I eventually like became one of the head writers of the, of the show. And eventually by my senior year, I was the host of, um, oh my gosh, what, oh my gosh, why am I brain farting right now? It was like our equivalent of a weekend update. And, okay. um, I mean, and it was like, but we would pull in crowds of like four or 500 students wow. um, and it was a small liberal arts school. And like, we would pack out the, uh, the auditorium. And so, but then in college, is when I started taking it really seriously and taking different improv classes. And my cousin lived at the time, she lived in Manhattan. And so on Christmas and summer breaks, I would fly up to Manhattan. I would stay with her. I took 
intensive improv and sketch classes at the Second City Training Center, the um, Upright Citizens Brigade Theater, the People's Improv Theater. And then I would perform at these festivals in Chicago and LA and actually went performed at a festival in Portland. And uh, I loved it. I loved it so much. I mean, my dream was to be on Saturday Night Live. That was all I ever wanted to do. And here I am like hosting a podcast and very much not on Saturday Night Live. But um, I loved it so much. And then I moved down to North Carolina and performed at the um, Dirty South Improv Comedy Theater here. And uh, it's funny because um, like my pinnacle, like the thing that really uh, was was uh, like a years in the making was I wrote and performed a one woman show called Harvey Wallbanger. And it was a 45 minute long show where I uh, sang. I mean, I wrote, directed and performed it. Um, I did uh, bring on a couple of directors to kind of help me. And I played 11, 12 characters. Uh, no. Yeah. And it, yeah, it took place uh, in a bar, the Seamus famous bar. And uh, it was just kind of like a, like a slice of life uh, sketch where it was you just all the different characters you would see in like a neighborhood bar. Um, including yeah. like the girl who's getting increasingly drunker at the karaoke and like just all the, the little things like that. Um, I did write it and perform it before I knew Jesus. So if you ask me, where does the video of it live? It yeah, lives, that's that's my next question. Uh, it lives in an archive um, that only very select people who will not Please. judge me <laughs> can see it. So. I will not judge. Yeah. So um, but yeah, so, it, you know, that was something that I just I loved. And I, you know, as I got older, I got married and I had kids and the comedy life is a rough life. Like yeah. it's not one for uh, really, it's hard to raise a family. I mean, there's a reason that ma- the majority of the people on SNL are not married and don't have kids. I think yeah. Keenan is like the exception, Keenan Thompson, yeah. um, because it's just, it's a grueling lifestyle. And I wasn't even living in New York yet. So yeah. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit of my background, but that's why I'm so passionate about it because it's just something that I cared about for so long. Yeah. Oh man, I just, I really wish we would have known each other when you were 13 and I was 13. <laughs> I know. And like, oh, because I just didn't, you know, in high school, I watched Saturday Night Live and I thought it was hilarious, uh, which interestingly enough, somebody, um, Lauren Michael said one time that everybody's favorite cast of SNL is from when they were in high school. Mm-hmm. Have you heard him say that before? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, so then I would, that would be true for me. Um, but I remember, uh, watching all that. Thought it was brilliant. All that I didn't, I didn't understand. I like, I kind of did, but I didn't have a name for it. That was sketch comedy or improv or anything like that. And then in high school, I did take one acting class and there was like one, it was either one day or one week that we focused on just improvising. Yeah. And it wasn't even supposed to be comedic improvising but I remember it's so weird like how much do you really remember from high school but I vividly remember this moment sitting on like a bench and I was doing a scene with Joe Krynak who was so cute oh Oh, (laughs) Oh, yeah (laughs) and I did something I did something that made the whole class laugh and made him laugh and I just remember being like whoa like what was that yeah and I just But I didn't know enough to like be like, is there an improv? I mean, maybe there had been at my high school. I just had no idea. And I'm sometimes I'm just like, I wish I would have gotten into this sooner. But I found it then in my adulthood. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Was it the Portland Improv Festival that you were a part of? Yeah. (laughs) It's my friends that started that. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's a small, tight knit community there. And so I was starting to speak with I was so I was working for my parents. And then I started a division of what they did for 18 to 35 year olds. So talking to young people about marriage and relationships, and dating and all that. And so people were asking me to come speak. And someone was like, hey, I think you would really enjoy like taking an improv class and it would help your public speaking. And I was like, yeah, also, I always do Q&A at the end of my speaking. So that would be, I should just take one class. Well, I took one class and I was like totally hooked, fell yeah. in love with the community. It just, I don't know if this was your experience, but it just feels like when you kind of get into an improv community, it's kind of just like a family. Yeah. And, um, so I loved it and I did it for five years and then, then we moved here. So I miss it dearly, but I think it's the same thing. Like a lot of my teachers would also go and do workshops for like doctors to help them with bedside manner. Like it's not about, it's not about being funny. And even some of my teachers would force us to do scenes just about listening and like speaking honestly in response to what you heard the person said and saying like, do not even try to be funny right now. Yeah. Um, 
So I think, I think one of the things that we kind of wanted to talk about is like, how does this play into, you know, being a good business owner or, yeah. a, you know, just a good human. And I think it's for, for active listening. And I'm sure you have this with interviewing, like I love to interview people. And as I listen to podcasts and you do this so well, I uh, like Dax Shepard, I've noticed he does it really well. Um, Pete Holmes, where they, you sometimes like they'll tell stories. And I feel like if you're just on the surface, like hearing them, you think, oh, wow, they kind of talk a lot for being an interviewer. But it's actually a really beautiful technique where they're offering something. We talked yeah. about that in improv of like you offer, you give something. Yeah. But they also like remember what it was that like triggered that question or that story. And they always circle back yep. to the person they're talking to and make sure that it keeps the momentum going. So it's not just telling a story just to tell a story. Right. It's to keep the energy going. And also when you give something to someone as an interviewer, then they also sometimes will feel like, oh, well, now I want to give something and the stories get richer and deeper. Yeah. Um, and so you learn those principles in improv classes. You do. Yeah. Between active listening and then also, I mean, I think maybe I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but one of the most, I mean, it's the foundational principle of improv is called, you know, yes. And, and that's yeah. this idea of saying yes to that gift that you were just yeah. referring to that, that thing that you've received, what that other person has saying, and then the and part being what can you then add to that rather yeah. than no, but because if yeah. somebody says something to you and you just say, no, well, you've just now shut down that idea. So yeah. we always used the very silly example of like, if somebody were to start a scene and walk out and be like, ah, I'm a dinosaur. And then if somebody comes out and is like, no, you're a fish, then it's yeah. just like, and scene, like nothing yeah. else yeah. can continue. Um, in the conversation. And yes, that's a very like ridiculous example. But if you think about in just communication in marriage, in friendships, mm -hmm. um, and then obviously yeah. through interviews and, and, and doctors with bedside manner, if you are continuously shutting down somebody else's idea. Now, yes, and yeah. doesn't mean that you have to agree with yeah. them. Yeah, yeah. It's more an agreement in I hear what you're saying and yeah. let's let's move this idea or this conversation forward, um, which yeah. I feel like is a lost art these days. <laughs> yeah. let's, let's be honest. Um, but yeah, so I mean, what are some of the things that prior to improv, maybe you uh, you did when you were you know doing speaking and things like that, that then as you were growing in your skill set of, of interviewing and doing Q&As and, and speaking and running conferences and things like that, that once you started learning improv and some of those principles and applying them, you were like, oh, this is yeah. a, this is a like game changing type, not to use like a cliche, but like a, a yeah. game changing thing that I can implement um, and makes me a better communicator. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I, so when I started taking improv classes, then I just became obsessed with it. And I would like for my birthday, my parents would be like, okay, your gift is that you get to go to Chicago or you get to go to New York and like go to these shows. I would go by myself to yeah. UCB. Oh, yeah. heck yes. <laughs> heck yes. All day long. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I loved it so much. I mean, what there was like those shows that you had to wait in line for mm -hmm. at UCB. Yeah. That Ask Hat. Did Ask we talk Hat. about that? Yes. One? Yeah. And they had, you could buy tickets in advance, but you had like a month out, you had to get on the internet and I would do that. And you had to refresh and then grab a ticket or you could stand in line for like five hours for their free show. Yeah. And I did that multiple times. But anyways, um, so I was, I became a lover of watching the best, you know, perform. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I noticed about really good comedians is that they're noticers mm -hmm. and they just notice every single little detail. They're, they're also typically very well read yeah. about everything, like everything from pop culture to like news so that when they're doing a scene, they can bring as much information. Cause if someone, I remember one time doing a scene where someone was doing like Lord of the Rings references and I was like, Oh boy. Ooh, yeah. ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where I'm going with this. Cause I'm not really into Lord of the Rings. Um, but I think that of just really being a noticer. And, um, and so when I do interview people, I think sometimes we, um, when we're thinking, well, a prime example is one time I was interviewed by someone, it was, I was on a panel. So there was like five of us and the interviewer had her list of questions in front of her. And she was so focused on the questions that she had pre prepared. Yep. That she asked one of us a question and someone jumped on and kind of added and heightened the answer, which inadvertently kind of addressed the next question. 
but she wasn't listening. She wasn't paying attention. She was just robotically being like, and here's the next question. And she asked it and everyone in the audience is like, that was just answered. So yeah. it just kind of was like, oh, wow, that's not, that's not moving things along. That kind of, that's no budding in a sense. Yeah. And I want it, I want you to expand a little bit on that, the, the yes and. I think sometimes when we hear it, like you said, it doesn't mean that we, you know, say, hey, I, yes, you're treating me terribly right now. And to <laughs> yes and you in our marriage, I'll say, yay. Yeah. But like, I think an example in the improv scenario could be something like where someone comes on stage and says like, I'm going to rob you. You know, you don't just go, okay, great. Yeah. Like that's not listen. Yes. Anding them is acknowledging what they just said. Right. And you might go, oh no, you're not, you yeah. know, and then like interacting with them. So yes. Yeah. Anding is just engaging and listening. And so I think as an interviewer, I really, I think people hunger to be asked questions. Yes. And even if you feel like you're going into territory that might be a little bit like, oh, maybe I shouldn't ask them that. You can always preface things with like, hey, if you don't feel comfortable or, but if, but if you notice something, like if let's say somebody's going, um, you know, yeah, so I started my career, you know, I thought I was going to do truth and reconciliation. And then, um, you know, some crazy stuff happened in my life and it took a turn and I, I went into fashion. You know, someone who doesn't want to like, push any buttons might go, oh, fashion. Okay. So tell me about that. What I would do, what you would do would go, what were the crazy turn of events? Yes, you know? exactly. hundred percent. Yeah. So that's what we mean by being a noticer. And that's what the skills of improv, because you, when you're on stage, you're nervous, mm -hmm. you're thinking like, what am I going to offer back to them? And sometimes when you're so in your head, you completely miss what they offered you. And then the scene falls flat. But if you really, really are listening and you really, really are paying attention, it's incredible to be in a scene where it flourishes, where it yeah. comes full circle. And so that's where I just, I, it, it really did impact how I, especially in the Q&A situation where I would just play off of people and it just became really fun. It wasn't nerve wracking at all because of the foundations of improv. I'm going to take a quick break from my chat with Joy to thank our partner of the show. And that is Mama Suds. You know that I am such a fan of Mama Suds. Michelle Smith has been on the show before. They've been a partner of mine for years. I use their products. I love, love, love this company. And what Mama Suds does is helps label reading moms and dads create a safe and non-toxic home for their family by creating synthetic free household cleaners. And one of those cleaners is their Mama Suds fine linen soap, which is the best thing since sliced bread. You can wash your high quality sheets, your linens, your delicates, your organic fabrics with a fine linen soap to keep them looking newer and softer longer. All you have to do is use three to four capfuls for high efficiency machines on a delicate cycle or four to six capfuls on a regular machine on a delicate cycle. Head on over to mamasuds.com. Use the coupon code Molly for 15% off your order. Now, without further ado, back to my conversation with Joy Egrich Reed. I love that you, you, the word that you used of describing good improvisers as noticers. And mm -hmm. that is something that like I have really tried. That's a skill I've tried to hone um, because I love noticing little details. And that was, I think why like, uh, you know, you and I are currently doing a, uh, a real challenge, which is fantastic. <laughs> um, it's like the best thing ever when, I, when you were like, do you want to do a real challenge? I'm like, yes, I do. Um, and, and for the listeners, it's real R E E L, e -E -L like on Instagram. <laughs> and, uh, and so the first, uh, reel that I challenged you to was, a an audio from family guy. And I'm going to link it in the show notes because it's brilliant. Um, but there's like a little detail of, uh, like you're, you're holding a bunch of baguettes and butter, but then there's like a giant knife just like sticking out of the side of your house coat. And I was like, oh, brilliant. Like just the perfect detail that I like, I love to notice. Yeah. And, and I always, I think my interview style, which it's funny because sometimes when I get people who are coming on the show, they want me to send them a list of questions that I'm going to ask them. And I'm like, I'm not going to do that. And yeah. it bothers people so often. They're like, well, do you not prepare? I'm like, I absolutely prepare, but that yeah. I'm not going to have a list of pre-written questions because that leaves zero room for yes anding and listening and yeah. seeing the direction that the conversation might take. Like I've had people on the show where I th go into the episode thinking, oh, we're going to talk about one thing. And by the end, we've talked about something completely different. And I'm so glad yeah. that I didn't like 
pigeonhole myself into asking yes. one specific set of questions. Um, well, when you and you and Sharon says so, yeah. both found out that your parents passed from Agent Orange. Like I was like on the edge of my what? while I was walking around my apartment listening, yes. but like I was like, oh my goodness, right. you really heard like how much it touched you to like find it, it feels like you said there's like a community of people yeah who have lost parents to this and it was just like I found I heard you guys like finding each other in this and it was yeah. so beautiful yeah if you had been like okay and question one yeah. D now we would have never gotten there. And there's, yeah. um, I just interviewed, uh, Ken Coleman, who's a, a Ramsey personality, yeah. um, a couple weeks ago. And we discovered at the very beginning of the show that, um, we're both from Virginia. His little brother is the golf coach at the college that I went to. And yeah. like some of his, his little brother's students, like my dad coached. And then his first job out of college was working for the governor of Virginia at the time. My first job out of college was working for the governor of Virginia. It was like really weird. Like, how would we have ever known that had we not just had a fun, active listening type conversation? You get to you get those little like those little gems. Um, Yeah. Follow the rabbit trails, I feel like is the best result for an improv scene or an interview or just a conversation at a party. Yes. You know. I mean, I used to, and even on airplanes, like when I used to travel much more, it was just like, if somebody found out like that I, at the time when I worked for my parents, like that I directed marriage conferences, I mean, everybody wants to talk about their relationship problem. (laughs) And I bet you've learned some really interesting things. Oh, I mean, some weird conversations, but it was just like, that's, I think it was traveling for that job that made me realize how hungry people are to like, just be asked. Cause I just don't, I don't have that filter of like being afraid to ask the question that I want to ask. Me too. And I don't think I am really genuinely (laughs) trying to think right now. I don't think I've ever, I actually, I have one situation with a friend that was going through a divorce that I felt like I was trying to ask her how she was feeling about it. And I think she projected that I was being, you know, judgy or whatever, yeah. which I wasn't, but, um, that is truly the only scenario I can think of where somebody has not wanted me to ask them how they're doing or ask them details about what happened in a relationship. Most people just want to be asked and we're too afraid to ask. Yeah. I don't know why. Why do you think that is? I think it's a fear of being judged for asking or seeming intrusive, Mm-hmm. Um, I think is maybe the word, but yeah, cause I, there's been times where, you know, I've had somebody where I'm interviewing them and, and like, maybe they've had something really traumatic and personal happen to them. And I always, before recording generally will be like, is there anything that's just like totally off limits that you don't want yeah. me to ask about? And I've had maybe one or two people get me like, oh, I don't really want to talk about this. And I'm like, okay, that's totally fine. Um, but generally people are like, no. Yeah. And if, I think if you ask the question in earnesty, like in, yeah. in genuine, like, love and and wanting to learn more about that person and not in like a please tell me all of your most traumatic moments um in your life and and understanding that it's it's coming from a place of wanting to understand I think that people are more receptive but yeah I think generally people are afraid it's I mean and I could go off on a whole rabbit hole tangent which I won't but like it's why Americans are so terrible with grief like mm-hmm. we are so bad with grief. If somebody's grieving, we're just like, uh, I don't want to be around that person because it's going to make me uncomfortable. Yeah, um, yeah. And it was just like, no, like, this. but ever so many other cultures are not like that. Um, yeah. and I always like, I, and a lot of cultures, I think too, they don't have a filter in asking questions. I mean, um, my Kenyan friends, like, we'll just go ahead and like ask questions. Like one time when I was in Kenya uh, a couple years ago, this was like right after I'd had my son um, and <laughs> some of the sweet Kenyan women, they were like, ah, you have gotten bigger. And I'm like, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for noticing my weight, my weight gain. I really appreciate that. And they're like, you look amazing. You've gotten bigger. And I'm like, thank you. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> you're, and- like, you're a noticer. You should take improv. <laughs> yeah, you're, like, you're a noticer. Or, um, or uh, that scene, in, if anybody's a Ted Lasso fan, I think about that oh, scene yeah. where... Uh, oh, um, the darts. Yeah, the Oh, so good. Oh, so good. So good. But then you have uh, the one, it's the, um, the Dutch player. And then he's like yeah. asking a really question. And then somebody's like, wow, that's really rude. And then uh, Sam Obisanya is like, he's not being rude. He's just being Dutch. Dutch. And like, yeah, that's just, you know, so I think it can be a cultural thing as well as just Americans yes. have yeah. a harder time with that kind of stuff. 
Okay, obviously I could talk improv all day long, but there's one more thing uh, improv related and then we're going to talk about uh, your book and some of the work that you're doing with that. Is there an improv group or an improv performer that stands out that you've seen that just like forever will stick in your mind? It's like, that's like one of the greatest improvisers or improv groups I've ever seen in my life. Oh man. Yeah. Well, I, um, my husband jokes that I have a crush on him, but, um, when I went to New York, I, I hadn't, I wasn't watching the Mindy project. You remember that show? Yeah. yeah. But there, Adam Pally, mm-hmm. do you know him? Yeah. He came on as like a surprise improviser um, and uh, for that Ask Cat show. And it was, it was, um, who's the woman from uh, A Sister Act? She was a really funny nun. Oh yeah, I know exactly who you're talking about. She's, yeah. I've seen her in a bunch of stuff lately. I can't remember the actress's name. Yeah. Yeah, we all know who you're talking about. So she was the, she was the storyteller. Oh, so that's the, the format. Yeah. The format of Ask Cat is that they have like a, a monologist. Is yeah. that the right word? Yeah. So someone from the audience says like, she goes, give me something. And someone says squirrel. And then she thinks, and she tells whatever story comes to mind from, so she improvises a story, but that's a real story. And then the improvisers are listening. And um, I mean, uh, who else was there? Um, A.D. Bryant was there. Yeah. And then this Adam Pally, and I just wasn't familiar with him. I hadn't seen his work before. And it was just like, and you don't realize that a lot of these people who are in scripted shows do have background yeah, in improv. Yeah, so and many. he was, I mean, I was crying laughing. I was just, and my friend was like, yeah, he's from the mini project. I was like, I have no idea who he was, but then I just became like an Uber fan. He's just real off color, just crazy comedian, but I thought he was brilliant. Um, I also went and saw that famous show at IO. It's those two guys, TJ and, did you ever see oh, that show? Um, TJ and Dave? Is yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's really slow improv. So that's really like they do. It's like brilliant. Yeah. Um, So if you, if you get uncomfortable watching an improv that like doesn't quite pick up and go, don't go to that show, but it was like their minds and the way they work. That was really fantastic. Fantastic. Oh man. I could, yeah, there's, yeah, I could talk about that forever, but yeah, that show Ask Cat in New York was definitely my favorite thing to go see. Yeah. Well, my, my favorite of all time, and I had tickets to go see them before the pandemic hit. Um, and I so did not get to go is improvised Shakespeare. If you've ever seen it, oh, yes, they're yes, unbelievable. I saw that. Unbelievable. Yes. Oh. And I tell people all the time, I'm like, if you are ever in Chicago, I don't care what you do, go yes. see improvised Shakespeare. It is the most yes. unbelievable <sighs> thing I've ever seen in my entire life. They basically get an idea, a play, a title of a play that was never written by Shakespeare, but then they perform it in the style of Shakespeare. They wear the traditional garb. They speak in traditional Shakespearean English. It's It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. And it's just, it is another level. (laughs) Yeah, that was another level because it was like, even uh, I went with my sister-in-law, Sarah, and we were just... You're, you're laughing, but you're also jaw to the ground oh, that they're unreal. able to do that. It's and so there was like funny. one scene I remember where they started riffing um, and doing where they were doing sentences back, Shakespearean yes. sentences back and forth, yes. but alphabetically. Yes. So it was like one of them would say something and it was an A and then the next one was a B. And it was just like, my, my mind was How do you do that? Yeah, I don't know. Do okay. <laughs> All right. So obviously, uh, this is hopefully a lesson to everyone. Go take an improv class if you ever get a yeah. chance. It's It really will impact your communication style in so many different ways. Even And don't try to be funny. Just be you. Don't try to be funny. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, you obviously, you, you launched this incredible uh, speaking and literary agency. And during the pandemic, uh, when you were, uh, you guys had escaped Paris for a little bit and you were staying with your parents in Michigan, uh, you wrote yes. a book called Get to the Publishing Punchline, um, which I have read has been uh, so helpful for me. And one of the things that was really cool about that book, which, uh, you know, you can kind of give the quick summary of it, um, but is that you have kind of this give back component to it was you wanted to get something in the hands of kids who are in the foster system um, to get them to uh, to encourage them to write. Um, so talk about the book and and how uh, Bernard the Baguette came about. <laughs> oh man, well yeah. So I I wrote the book because I was I was back in Michigan. I had um, my mom, you know, taking care of my kids a bunch, and I was also working with 
I just, I'm one person and I can't say yes to all the authors that, you know, I want to work with. I also realize that there's a part to the publishing process that feels really mysterious to a lot of people. And that's writing a book proposal. If you've ever considered writing a book and looked into it, you know that to get an agent or a publisher's attention, you typically have to write this whole proposal thing. And, but you know, you're Googling and one site might say to do it one way. Another says to say it another way. And I was like, you know what? I walk through this with my authors, um, but maybe I can help more people. And this doesn't have to be this like thing that you only find out once you get an agent. Like I should just tell people what I know and maybe I'll get blacklisted from the publishing industry. (laughs) Um, Coincidentally enough, a, a lot of my colleagues at publishing houses are like, thank you for doing this because you know, it really, I feel like it put in one place, everything that someone needs to know. And it allows me to help more people than I can on my own. So it was really fun to do. I also think that people sometimes feel really lonely in the writing process. And also like, it can be overwhelming. And I was like, I'm going to write something that is funny, in my opinion, if you don't like my humor, you're not gonna think it's funny, but um, (laughs) and makes people feel not alone. So I wrote it in like a dialogue where like you as the author would be like, yeah, but what about this? Because I've worked with so many authors saying, yeah, but what about this? Um, So it hopefully makes them feel like they kind of have a friend along the way in this process. Um, But yeah, a principle of punchline is that we give away 10% of our our gross profits and which isn't always... (laughs) easy in a pandemic when you have a speaking agency. Um, But it's just something that we wanted to be a part of what we do. And I think I was thinking about with this book, like, I I think it was, I had had a conversation with one of our speakers, Ben Sand. He's a part of an organization called The Contingent, and it has several different organizations within it. And one of them is Every Child. And I just love what they do. They serve um, DHS workers. They serve kids that are going into the foster care system. So many facets of people who are just in the quote system they serve. And, um, and I remember a conversation with someone from every child just saying how in these, these DHS waiting rooms, a lot of times the kids are just sitting there listening to the caseworker call foster families going, can you take them? Oh, you can't. Okay. And then like, oh, you can't. Okay. And that just like broke my heart to think about them sitting there listening to that. And every child creates these welcome boxes, which, you know, gives them a few things of ownership. I I find ownership with kids so interesting, you know, like when they start understanding like this thing's mine. And so you realize that they probably have an unstable home and now they're in a new foreign place and they're hearing other people's families saying, no, we can't take them. And I was like, maybe I could do something where it could just really take them into like another kind of world. And so I started the first, so in Bernard the Baguette, <laughs> which is, it's not me that wrote it. It's Bernard. He's a Baguette. He's yeah, French. Obviously. And um, so he, it's called Writing with Bernard the Baguette, A Kid's Fun and Silly Guide to Discover the Joys of Writing. A little play on my name. And, um, and I started with this thing called Imagination Station, which was imagining, I was imagining the kids in these DHS rooms. And I was like, how can I teach them to just look around at the objects, like whether it's a chair or a, you know, a desk or Janet at the front desk who looks scary and like looking at them and noticing and then writing down characteristics and then changing that chair into, you know, Robert, the robot or the plant into like Perdita, the plant, and then writing a story. And I just wanted them to get lost in their imagination. And so that was the impetus to this. And then I was like, oh, and then I could also teach them about uh, writing memoir, teach them about what memoir is, because having their own stories and trying to like help them reflect on times in their life that were good, were, you know, um, and and just crafting that narrative. Um, And then I was like, and then I can teach them about journalism as well. So it's like these Three, you know, we, we say it's for kids ages seven to 12, which is a big range, but they all kind of like build on each other. So like the imagination station one is a little bit more elementary and then it gets a little bit more uh, difficult, but I wrote it just with the intention of for every copy of my book, get to the publishing punchline sold. I would send one to a kid uh, at every child. Um, and then people heard about it and they're like, well, we want this kid's book. We don't care about your book. <laughs> we want the kid's book. Um, and so we just put it up on Amazon and the same thing will happen. So if you buy, get to the publishing punchline or you get writing with Bernard the Baguette, a copy of Bernard the Baguette will go to a kid in the foster care system. So I think I'm actually more excited about it than I am about my own book. Um, just because I hope that it will really, um, I don't know, give kids a sense of, cause they can write their name on the front. That's my favorite part too. Like, yeah. so they can be like, this is my book. I yeah. love this. 
<laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I think that's incredible. And I love, uh, I just applaud the creative way that you have used your gifts to give back. Um, and that's something that, um, obviously I care very much about. It's why I like started a whole podcast around this topic, um, is yeah. just people who are using their particular unique skills and gifts and using it to impact others. Um, and obviously like coming from, uh, you know, as somebody who's a believer in, and somebody who's faith, like I believe that God gave us all these all really unique gifts and yeah. he gave you a really incredible gift of, of communicating and writing and imagination. And then the fact that you can then take that and impact other kids and, and hopefully like, you know, the next, uh, you know, like Kristen Hanna is like coming up through the, uh, through the foster care system. And it's just like, yeah, yeah, Bernard the Baguette inspires like these young writers, these young creatives. So, um, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm so excited about, I bought the book for my daughter who is, uh, she is eight and she's in that kind of age range where she just wants to write and create all the time. Um, and so I'm really excited to give that to her and see, you know, if that kind of helps to steer her and because she's at that age right now, she's like, I want to write a book. And I'm like, Oh, you do. Oh. Huh? And I'm like, what do you want to write it about? And she's like, I don't know. And, you know, so I'm like hoping that maybe that's the thing that will begin to give, yeah. her, give her that like the focus that she needs. Cause she's also, Oh man, I would love to talk with her about yes. it after she goes yes. through it. We yeah. Totally so have like just joy and Lily on an interview. It'd be very <laughs> fun. She, <laughs> she would really enjoy it. Um, okay. And then in 2022, you also have some writing cohorts that you're doing. Yes. And so, uh, talk about that for people who might be interested and in maybe, uh, you know, maybe they've, they've got it in the back of their head where they've always wanted to write a book. Yeah. Well, so the cohorts and my book is the publishing punchline kind of happened simultaneously because again, I was back in the U S and I was just trying to figure out how can I help people with that beginning process. And so I started again, thanks to the Marco Polo app, they should really sponsor me. <laughs> they really should. Um, yeah. I was like, you know, I, I think my brain always tries to, and this is probably part of the entrepreneurial part of me of just like, what's the problem we're solving for here? And, you know, there's a lot of literary agents out there, but I also feel like I have the skill set to communicate pe to people in a way that doesn't make them feel stupid. Cause I really felt stupid growing up that encourages people. I really love to encourage people and I like to help them get their butt in gear. And so I was like, I know that people talk about this book proposal process taking forever and that they were working on it for a year and they didn't quite know if they had it right. And so I was like, what if, and also people feel alone. And I mentioned this in their writing process. And I was like, especially in this day and age where you kind of have to, you know, quote, build a platform. And I think that that can look so many different ways. It's nice to have other writers that are going to celebrate you that can get to know you and your writing so that when your book does come out, they will tell other people about it. You need your little tribe. And so I was like, what if I got these small cohorts of of people that were all in the same kind of space of wanting to finish a book proposal together. And so basically it's the content from my book. We go through that together. They get it in their inbox, three emails a week, but then we're also all on Marco Polo together. Um, and then we also have a developmental editor that they all get a one-on-one -on -one meeting with. And then the developmental editor and myself as an agent stay in like their Google doc that has the format for how they do their proposal all month and we go back and forth. They knock everything out in 30 days. It is possible. Um, and then we have um, it fully edited and typeset. And then we've now in 2022, our cohorts, we have a like a marketing communication expert that is going to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with everybody to basically go, here's how to confidently talk about your book. Because again, we all get in our head of like, I'm putting this thing out into the world or I'm pitching to agents or I'm pitching to publishers um, that will meet with each cohort member as well. So we're doing five of those this year and they're all going to be really small. Um, but I'm super excited about it. Like it just is so much fun to me to hear everybody's book ideas. And with improv, I try to heighten people's ideas. So yeah. if you're like, Hey, I've, I've got this thing. And I'm like, that's great. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And it's so much fun for me. So if you're listening to this and you have wanted to write a book or you've been trying to do a proposal, um, these cohorts are just so much fun. Like people have met in person now, like they stay that's friends. So cool. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I yeah. love hearing that. Well, I'm going to make sure to have all of that information in the show notes for anybody that might be interested. And hopefully you can check it out and maybe fulfill like a lifelong dream. <laughs> All right. Well, obviously, Joy, I could have you on for like seven more hours um, and we'll just have to probably do like a part two, a part two, a part two yes. um, <laughs> uh, to this. Uh, but now is the portion of the show where I ask just some fun get to know you questions since we haven't already been getting to know you. Um, so, Joy, are you ready for the get to know you round? 
I'm sweating. I'm sweating, but I'm excited. Zoo, 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 okay. zoo, zoo. I need to have like the kazoo. The me 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 me. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Me me me. Why? That's not a sound that a kazoo makes. I don't know. <laughs> Anyway, okay. Uh, so, are you a music person? If so, what is the best concert you've ever attended? Oh, oh man, I am a I I am a music person. I could I could just throw out. Oh man, oh this is hard for me. Okay, Coldplay. I came to see in France long oh, before. That was the first time I ever came to France. That's what made me fall in love with France was seeing Coldplay. But what first popped into my mind. So that's what I should answer. Uh, because I was just telling my daughter Millie about it is that when I was three days before giving birth to her, um, my husband and I went to see Harry Connick Jr. Oh my gosh. Paris, and it was one of the, I really, I, I don't know, Cold player, Harry Connick Jr. They're very different. <laughs> they were awesome. But Harry Connick Jr. puts on a show. Have oh, you ever seen him? I have not. Oh, it's so, I mean, he's the Sinatra of our day. Yeah. So if you're into that, I say go see HCJ. All right. I like it. I like it. Okay. I know obviously you're a literary agent and so you, you know, enjoy books. And uh, I would, I'm curious to get your take on this. Do audiobooks count as reading? They better because that's all I do. Heck yeah. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Do you ever judge a book by its cover? Oh, yeah. Yeah. But I'm drawn to really beautiful covers, but again, that's subjective. People have different standards of beauty. Um, But I think, yeah, you also, if someone recommends a book to you and it's got a terrible cover, you should check it out because, you know, who knows who the in-house designer was at, you know, Books Are Us. Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, it's true. I I for sure judge a book by its cover, but I will also still read a book even if I don't like the cover, but I will often read a book if I like the cover and then I sometimes will be like, well, this was actually not that great. Um, okay. In the inevitable. to it, then no one can judge you anyways. Yes. You're not holding- <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Okay. So if someone were to play you in the inevitable movie that's going to be made about your incredibly oh. fascinating life, who do you want it to be? You know who I was just telling my husband uh, that I love? And of course, I'm going to blank on her name. I'm like, she's always a, like a, a supporting character. She's never a lead. And I want to see her as a lead because I love her. Is um, Are you watching The Shrink Next Door? No, I've never seen it. She's in so many movies and she's always the friend, but I think she's fantastic. (laughs) I always feel bad for the people that are like typecast as that. They're always the sidekick. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, Okay. Her name is Catherine Hahn. Oh, I don't know who that is, but I will look her up. You recognize it. You would recognize her because she's always the best friend. Oh yeah. Okay. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. 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 Okay. I want Catherine Hahn. All right. Catherine (laughs) Hahn. I like it. I like it. I'm a big fan. Um, Okay. And then my last question is uh, the question I ask all my guests. And that is, what does it mean to you, Joy, to run a business with purpose? That's a good question. Um, I mean, I think there's the standard, like obviously following your good ethics and and things like that. But I feel like even for people, we don't all get to run our own business. And I think, you know, thinking back to that um, boss that I mentioned I had that was like, you need to just take advantage of the raise that we want to give you or this next opportunity, even if you're not going to stay with us. I feel like as long as you are working and you've been given the opportunity to gift to steward that well Mm -hmm. and be faithful to what you're doing. Um, You know, not every career is going to last forever, especially if we have the entrepreneurial spirit, but like when you're in it, the word faithful is, has just like been a part of my life the last couple of years. Like, what does it mean to be faithful in the work that I do? And, And my husband, I always say, that we hope to work from a place of overflowing, Mm. not being overworked. Um, And so that's kind of the posture that I try to take. So I think that gives my work purpose if I am able to like create a life where I can bring that overflow to work and not being like, "Ah, ah, I got to get to work. I got to do this. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So Well, I think that's a beautiful answer. No one's ever given that answer. And I really love it. So Joy, thank you so much. This was such a joy uh, to have you on the show. I know everyone probably does like the play on words like, I'm so funny. Uh, I like it. um, So thank you so much for being here. And uh, again, for the listeners, I will have all of Joy's information along with the information about the cohorts and her books and her link to her hilarious reel in the show notes. (laughs) Well, I look forward to many uh, more real challenges with you. On it. (laughs) 
friend, I would love to know what you loved about this episode or something that you learned. Find me on social media. I'm at Still Being Molly or at Business with Purpose Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. And don't forget to use that hashtag Business with Purpose Podcast when you're sharing the show with a friend. Thanks so much for listening to this week's episode. If you are a first time listener of the show, welcome. Be sure to check out the archives for past shows featuring so many incredible entrepreneurs, business owners, community leaders who are changing the world. If you are a regular listener of the show, thank you. Thank you for your support. Thank you for tuning in week in and week out. Be sure to head on over to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Radio Public, Overcast, Stitcher, basically wherever you get your podcasts. Click that subscribe or follow button. To click that button means you will never miss a new episode of the show. And while you're there, would you take a moment to just leave a review? Would you take a moment to maybe share one of your favorite episodes with a friend? Leaving a review, sharing the show with a friend, It is totally free for you. And it is the biggest help for me in the entire world. You have no idea how much I appreciate it. It just also helps me to know what you're liking and how the show is impacting you. As always, this show is produced by the incredible team at Third Wheel Media. Thank you so much for listening. Now go do something good with purpose on purpose.